You're listening to a Frequency Podcast Network production in association with City News. At this point, there is not much left to say about Canada's housing crisis, especially about the average prices of family homes in our biggest cities. The numbers might seem shocking, but nobody's even surprised anymore. In Vancouver, the benchmark or median price for homes is just over a million dollars. The average price of a detached home in Toronto is now 1.7 million bucks. While there might not be much left to say about it, though, there is plenty left to actually do about it. For years, housing advocates have been begging every level of government to tackle this issue with serious policy, and serious funding, not only to try to get prices under control, but also to, you know, build more houses and quickly. Last week, at least one level of government pledged in the budget to do just that, except maybe for the quickly part. Over the next 10 years, we will double the number of new homes we will build. It was clear that housing was the top domestic focus of Finance Minister Christia Freeland's budget. But it wasn't the only priority. So what exactly is in this document? How exactly will it impact you and your family? How will and won't it change your day-to-day life? And what does it tell us about this government's plans for the future? Now that a deal with the NDP gives them a real future to plan for. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. This is The Big Story. Mike Eppel is the senior business editor at City News. Hello, Mike. Hello, how are you? I'm doing well. Thanks for joining us. Thank you. Why don't we start just with sort of the general uh, appraisal of the budget that Christia Freeland delivered last week. What kind of budget did we get? From a political standpoint, I don't think it was as far to the left as many observers may have thought it would be, considering the Don't call it a coalition with the NDP, the uh, supply deal that they have in store to avoid any confidence votes on the budget. At the same time, they're still spending more money than is coming in. So there is still a a pretty big deficit and uh, a lot of um, program spending that will have uh, legacy values, you know, at a time when (laughs) there's... There's an awful lot of uncertainty. Say what you will about the state of the economy today. You know, we're facing inflation, supply chain issues, all sorts of other things that can really derail things very quickly. And and Finance Minister Christopher Freeland made mention of all of that in the, um, the forecast, I suppose. So, you know, it's not without risk, but uh, maybe they didn't actually spend as much money as some people thought they would. I'm going to ask you a little bit more about that. And also, because I know you covered on Friday uh, some new jobs numbers, which were which were very good for Canada. Um, but you also mentioned the financial climate in general under which this budget was delivered. And, and, and you mentioned that Christia Freeland uh, had that in her notes. Can you kind of explain a little bit more about, you know, from your perspective, what Canadians have been experiencing over the last six months or a year, I guess? Well, we've seen... The pandemic shut down economies, reopen economies, the labor market, which was crushed and then subsequently revitalized so much so that now all of a sudden we've got the lowest unemployment rate on record at 5.3%. There have been wage pressures. There is obviously supply chain issues globally. And all of this went into the calculations in the budget, which I don't recall a previous document where there were scenarios, I guess, where they have, well, here's where we think the deficit will be, but if the war in Ukraine goes on long term, then we've got a different deficit projection, or if it ends faster than perhaps we think, then we've got another deficit projection. Hmm. So they've got, they've got quite a few uh, scenarios built in. And it's, and it's interesting how it kind of, it, it, it goes back to the war overseas 
and how that is uh, affecting prices and a problem with supply chain metrics that was already there because of the pandemic. So this is just built onto that. So there is, you know, it's, it's still kind of a best guess. Bottom line, though, this budget had a much lower overall deficit for the past year because we're seeing oil revenue just through the roof. <laughs> and, and, and what a revitalization that's been. I mean, we were less than two years removed from oil being worthless to now all of a sudden this uh, great commodity that, uh, you know, say what you will about it, is just a massive revenue generator for the government. Uh, that cut last year's deficit by about $30 billion. Hmm. You know, they're, they're, they are seeing more money coming in. I think the overall revenue is $85 billion above the previous estimates. So they had more money to work with, not saying that they're not spending quite a bit more as well, but uh, we've seen these massive shifts in, in incredibly short order. A little later, maybe we can talk about uh, what the war in Ukraine is doing to defense spending and and policy around that. But I think first, the one thing that I really want to ask you about is for most Canadians, and I think probably for the government, uh, the top line discussion was expected to be around housing prices and controls. And there was a lot of that in this budget. So Maybe just what did the government deliver in terms of both money and policy? About $10 billion in money and policy that is supposed to uh, help cities and municipalities work through red tape, if you will, to get projects started faster, which is fine. And uh, a lot of the cities are saying, yeah, we need support with this. Uh, the problem, if there is one, two things. First of all, you still need those projects to get built, so you need the developers to come in. And then at the same time, you need the space to build, and in what form. So we need more density in housing. And then you're going to immediately get pushback from residential centers that aren't necessarily used to <laughs> high-rise buildings going up next to detached uh, properties. So you're going to have this, this battle on your hands, uh, you know, to, to get things built. I mean, uh, Christopher Friedland was talking about the idea of building oh, 100,000 units a year. Okay, maybe. And, and, and even there, you wonder if that's going to be enough considering the size of uh, population growth, immigration that's forecast over the next several years, and the um, very strong likelihood that interest rates that we're going to see going forward are going to be a lot higher than where they are today. And how does that filter through to all of this? If people aren't necessarily buying homes, then they're going to look for places to rent. And are there rental properties available? There is no simple solution to this to um, bring housing prices down or get capacity built quickly. I think the wild card is going to be how much interest rates do go up and does that slow down price gains? And uh, secondly, the um, other initiative that they did announce was this ban, two-year ban on uh, foreign buyers coming in and uh, picking up residential properties and not actually living here, just buying it for investment. That might take a little bit of uh, cash out of the system. It was interesting that that only was for residential, not recreational properties. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can still buy something uh, on, a, on a lakefront someplace if you want to, if you're a foreign investor, but not the specific residential market. Again, we've seen a couple of provinces, BC and Ontario, put some of those things into effect. It had a, a marginal effect. There, there is some money going to low-cost housing development, which will help, but there's no quick fix. And uh, just because of demographic growth and uh, the, the, the growth of the economy, all of these things, you're, you're, you're kind of pushing against that. And uh, it's going to take a lot of uh, work. And we'll see exactly if, in fact, that has a, a, a quick fix. I don't, I don't think it will. I'm not going to ask you to be a, a housing policy analyst because I know uh, that's not necessarily your expertise. But I also know this is something uh, that you talk a lot about. And what fascinates me about the housing crisis and what the government can do about it is that, yeah, there's a huge need for housing, a huge need for uh, houses, family houses to become more affordable. But at the same time, there is a massive chunk of Canadians for whom their home is their retirement investment. And if you start aggressively lowering those prices, 
uh, you're going to be hearing from those people and they vote. Well, and the other thing, another policy that the budget started is a tax-free first-time home buyers account, which is similar to an RRSP. You know, potentially save forty thousand dollars, and you get if you put money into it, then you get the immediate uh, tax savings, similar to what you would do with a retirement savings account. And that so that's again a way for people to save to invest in housing for long term, like you say, retirement. Theoretically, if your if your home is your castle and that is your retirement strategy from an asset standpoint, then yeah, you've, you're effectively encouraging people to get into the housing market. Uh, the idea of a tax on a capital gain on your house, oh my goodness, that that is the third rail. That isn't going to happen, you know, from a voting standpoint. No one no one will vote for a government that uh, that puts into place. And and maybe even more so today considering what the housing market has done just over the past couple of years. You don't want to do too much that's going to uh, see people losing property value because who's going to get blamed for that? The people who put in the policy to make that happen. What is in this budget? And, you know, housing is one thing. And if there's anything else left to mention there, uh, for sure. But what is in this budget that will hit Canadians right away? You know, there's always kind of a balance between, oh, yeah, yeah we're going to build hundreds of thousands of homes. And, you know, we're talking at that point, we're talking three, five plus years down the road. Um, what's in here now, either good or bad for Canadians who are, you know, looking at their checkbooks? This budget had nothing from my perspective, just reading it through, I was looking going, what's the headline here? What is it that people are going to wake up to this morning and say, oh, that has lowered my costs because the number one voting issue right now is inflation. Mm -hmm. And honestly, I don't see anything that is necessarily reducing the cost of everyday life, at least not immediately. They didn't cut the gas tax. They weren't going to, of course, but that's just one idea, right? That's been a bellwether for inflation. How much is it costing me to fill up the gas tank? There are a number of things, again, longer term that may lower costs. Uh, but again, there's nothing, one item that says, yep, this is, this is affecting my life effective immediately. The one thing that, you know, does have a, an effect, though, uh, the dental care program, that was, uh, you know, put together at the behest of the NDP, where uh, kids under 12 will have free dental care. But again, that is only if your family income is $90,000 or less. So it doesn't affect everybody. Hmm. And again, this is the first budget of the new mandate. Right. <laughs> what, are we, what are we seeing in Ontario politics right now? We're coming close to an election. All of a sudden, there are all sorts of things flying around from the Ford government uh, to make life more affordable. So, you know, that that's that's politics, electioneering, what do you want to whatever you want to call it. Come 2024, 25, then you're going to start to see maybe some more uh, things that would affect day to day life. When we were talking about uh, what would be in the budget uh, amongst our team uh, before it came out, you know, we were assuming that there was going to be something, even if it might not necessarily work well, uh, something that they could point to and say, like, yes, life is getting more expensive. Here's how your government is helping you. And it does kind of feel, especially given the way uh, Pierre Polyev and the conservatives are attacking them on this issue specifically, that it was an interesting choice to just be like, you know what, we're going to punt that down the road and, and see what happens. And yes, we're building to uh, an entire mandate of budgets. Well, they're, they're, they are working on some of the supply chain metrics, you know, the the floods in British Columbia last year were a wake up call to how integrated um, the rail lines were or are in the economy. So Transport Canada is getting some money, for example, I think a half billion dollars to improve and uh, build up the the infrastructure to avoid, you know, one rail line going out, and all of a sudden the whole uh, supply chain in the economy is is. Uh, thrown off course, right. things like that. Again, these are longer term initiatives, not necessarily immediate. This <laughs> budget was 300 pages long. There are a whole host of grab bag line items that, uh, you know, they're, they're not necessarily the big headlines, but they will affect uh, particular components of the electorate. And there's going to be a, a big messaging effort, I'm guessing, 
uh, from the Trudeau government going forward on uh, a, a number of these initiatives. It's different though now. The, the, the pandemic changed everything. <laughs> Typically, the day after the budget, you would see the finance minister making the rounds on Bay Street in downtown Toronto, maybe starting with a breakfast uh, meeting up in Ottawa and then going to Toronto and then crossing the country with speeches and you know talking up what the, the government is doing in its latest uh, fiscal planning. Mm. They're not doing that. Now, maybe a virtual meeting. I didn't see one. They are doing, I think, one on on, on Friday. They did one on, in Hamilton, a photo op. But it's not like it used to be where we had immediate uh, feedback, I guess. And, and, and the messaging on this budget to begin with was different. It wasn't until really Wednesday morning, the day before the budget was released, that we got any into, uh, leaks, so to speak, that kind of formulated what the government was intending to do with the budget. There would previously be days, if not weeks of, hey, something's coming out and this is what we're kind of, uh, you know, preparing, I suppose, the the message of what the budget would be. Right. That started Wednesday. On Friday, it, it was pretty limited already. You know, it was, it was almost a one day event. I, I, it's it's remarkable how quickly the narrative changes. Well, let's get to just a couple of other things uh, in the budget then. I mean, we mentioned it off the top, you know, uh, a guiding factor behind this budget is the war going on in Ukraine. Um, what stood out in terms of of policy around that, either uh, aid to Ukraine directly or just, I know, uh, several uh, several European NATO countries have have beefed up their defense spending, um, and certainly ours has been very low. What are they saying about that? Well, the, the defense budget's going up by $7.2 billion over five years. Uh, that brings our NATO commitment to 1.5% of GDP, which is supposed to be the, the, the call from NATO is for 2% of total economic uh, output on defense spending, so we're still well below. Half a billion immediately on uh, military aid uh, to Ukraine. So this, you know, that was, I wouldn't call it a, a last-minute addition, but again, they did have more money to work with overall. So they, uh, going from not talking about defense at all in, in previous years to all of a sudden actually sending more cash to the Defense Department for uh, new equipment. And th- by the way, this doesn't include, as near as I can tell, uh, the procurement of uh, new uh, Lockheed Martin stealth fighters, <laughs> which was uh, just uh, talked about a few weeks back after years of uh, punting that procurement down the road. That's still, to, that's still to come. And that's something like $25 billion, hmm. but that'll likely be in future budgets once the deal is actually signed. I, again, it's it's a change. I will say it's a change from from previous years where defense was really much relegated to the the side because there just wasn't any political will to do so. And when you've got the NDP already saying that they're going to support the budget, well, then yeah, you, they get the dental care program. But on the side, you you have to take a little bit more defense spending, whether you like it or not. Hmm. And you could almost argue. You could almost argue. That the the deal the NDP cut with the liberals for this supply and confidence agreement almost gave the the Trudeau government more ease to move back to the center for things like defense spending uh, because they knew that would it wouldn't even get any pushback it, it, because the, <laughs> the the NDP are going to support the budget regardless as long as you give you know what, what maybe what they're calling for earlier in the week uh, last week we saw the the Bay du Nord deep water drilling project, you know, environmental groups were up in arms about that, but yeah, we're got to do that because the world needs oil. Say what you will about it in the short term, they're calling it transitional law, all that sort of. So you've seen the political maneuvers out of this as well, uh, coming back to uh, budgetary measures. I'm glad you mentioned uh, deep water drilling and environmental policy specifically, because that was the last thing that I wanted to ask you about. We just did uh, last week an episode on how far we have to go to hit our electric vehicle targets and how far off uh, Canada is from being on track for that. And, and in that episode, our guest said, you know, it'll be interesting to see in the next round of budgets, you know, federally, provincially, et cetera, if they're really pushing more incentives for this. So what did we get on environmental policy? $12 billion in spending. It was not in, in insignificant. Okay. There was a lot of tax credits for carbon capture. 
And what they did was interesting. They said those tax credits are going to end in 2031. So if you want them, if you want to get into that business, do it now. And that, and that's trying to speed up the push toward net zero uh, and incentivizing uh, private sector investment. Industry Canada is getting a bunch of money for uh, the rollout of electric vehicle charging stations because that you, you got to have the infrastructure yes. if you want to have electric cars, right? So that's another thing. That's exactly what we just talked about. Yeah, that there are, is almost nothing in many communities. Right. So you need that because it's fine to have an electric car. If you don't have any place to plug it in and get a rapid charge, well, what good is it? So there, there is, this was, you know, very much a, 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 a green budget, I guess, you, you, if you want to call it that, with these various uh, incentivizations, I suppose, to get, to get moving on that. And, uh, it, the irony, of course, is it's being it's being funded by oil money, <laughs> right? <laughs> and revenue coming from that. So, you know, but but you know, the, the finance minister was saying, look, this is this is a long term initiative, and we got to get the private sector on board, and, and to some extent, uh, they're they're certainly going to do some of that. I just want to ask you if there's anything else in this document that stands out to you uh, about the budget. The thing that stands out to me after talking to you here is is you've used the words long term initiative uh, several times. <laughs> That's about right. I, I don't want to dismiss the fact that uh, the banks got hit a little bit for all of the money that they were making in 2021. Uh, you know, some of the revenue will be coming from this surtax that's put on the bank profits from last year of uh, 15%, anything over a billion dollars. So that was uh, not insignificant. And they raised the corporate tax rate on the banks as well. And some of the life insurance companies. What was interesting, though, was that was something the prime minister campaigned on uh, last year, hitting, you know, the, the biggest money makers in the economy. And of course, the banks are saying, why are you just targeting us? But the overall taxation rate actually did not go up as much as some had thought it would. So it's, uh, I don't know if you want to call it a, necessarily a win, but uh, it's going to raise that taxation level is going to raise about oh, $5 billion over five years, I think it is. So that's it's not necessarily massive, but it's also not and insignificant. And again, there were no tax breaks or anything for you know, personal income taxes or anything of that nature. Again, those things will all come if they ever do uh, later in a government's mandate. And this is my last question. You know, the way we're looking at this right now, I guess, is uh, the first step of at least three, maybe four um, budgets. What do you think, given that context, how do you think, given that context, was this budget received? Like a starter kit or a reasonable step? Um, it seems to me like, you know, the Conservatives were going to be against it anyway. We already knew the NDP was going to be for it. So, you know, you might as well do what you got to do. I think the, from a economic standpoint, the worry is that, yes, the economy has recovered significantly, but there are still a lot of potential shocks that could really derail um, the overall performance of the economy and the amount of money that's coming in from a revenue basis. So, like I said, they didn't they didn't spend up to the limit necessarily, and the debt to GDP ratio and all of those things that the ratings agencies look at, they're improving over the the course of time. It's kind of the the start, I guess. They got the the dental program this time. Next year, you're going to hear about pharmacare, which of course they've talked about for years. <laughs> but that's going to be something that'll that'll have to be negotiated um, with with the drug companies, and I'm guessing uh, similar to the childcare deal with the provinces. Um, so that'll be maybe the highlight of next year's budget, and then following that, then we're more into the election cycle of hey, look what we've done for you, and uh, you know the then all the other grab bag of things that'll come out, and uh, we'll see exactly how long this deal with the NDP actually lasts. You never know. I mean, that that could, they're saying three years, but a lot of things can change pretty quickly in politics, as we all know. Mike, thank you so much for walking us through this. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Mike Apple, Senior Business Editor at City News. That was The Big Story. For more from us, head to thebigstorypodcast.ca. Find us on Twitter at thebigstoryfpn. Talk to us anytime via email, thebigstorypodcast. That's all one word at rci.rogers.com. You can also find us in every podcast player. You can ask for us on any smart speaker. Just say, play the Big Story podcast. Thanks for listening. I'm Jordan Heath-Rawlings. We'll talk tomorrow.